Unconfirmed number of people buried alive. Joseph Stahl health suffers as government indecisiveness continues. And amendments on MVIL reforms to be discussed in 2021. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Tuesday's news. An unconfirmed number of people believed to be alluvial miners have been buried alive in the Saki area of the Waitapa LLG in the Golala district. Reports emerging from this remote area with photos confirm there has been a landslide and while, this, while social media has been abuzz with a number of casualties, authorities are yet to confirm the total number of deaths and the extent of the damage. A team including the local member and Minister for Transport William Sam and provincial disaster officials visited the site today and will be able to provide a brief upon their return. Member for Goilala William Sam returned from his electorate this morning and provided a media briefing before heading back to the mountains to assess the situation on the ground. On his first trip this morning, he took some photos of the landslide from air. While no confirmed details are available, it's believed the people buried in this landslide are alluvial miners. The local people know. It's the uh, alluvial miners from outside who are there. So, From photos supplied by the member, a good number of makeshift shelters can be seen in the middle of the forest, believed to be built by alluvial miners who camp around here to pan gold. The landslide occurred in the early hours of yesterday morning when everyone was fast asleep. Uh, we advise uh, the media that there is an incident there where alluvial miners were buried uh, alive early morning of uh, Monday. Uh, in their uh, little hamlet. They were all asleep early morning, so when the slide came down, then uh, uh, sadly they all buried alive. Minister Sam confirmed the location of the landslide is far from Tolokuma and believes the landslide could have been caused by too much rain. Oh, it's, uh, it's, away from the, uh, it's away from the existing mine, but Maybe it's due to uh, uh, clearance of the, the uh, forest and exposure to uh, weather. So, uh, and then the uh, alluvial activity at the base of the hill. And then that gave way to the water, water to uh, soil to uh, lose. The member and the provincial disaster team will do an assessment before work begins to retrieve the bodies buried here. He further raised the need to educate locals about alluvial mining so as to prevent similar incidents in future. Central Governor Robert Agarobe is expected to visit the site tomorrow and says he is in communication with the police to mobilize assistance if need be. And then we will see how we mobilize the expect, experts to go up. As we speak now, I've also sent in a message to the, our police uh, commander, uh, Junior Wagambi, to also talk to the military to see or to be on standby if we can have an explosive expert as well, just in case. On, on the worst case, we need to clear up that dam, that build up of the natural dam. The team that left today expected to return late today and fresh footage and information should be made available tomorrow. Ruth Rungola, National MTV News. There's a health crisis in Joseph Stahl, Medang province that many people don't know about. The isolation, no road access and a chronic shortage of medicine has contributed to the high number of infant and maternal deaths. Women with birth complications have little hope of being saved. Between 2013 and 2015, the Catholic Archdiocese of Medang spent more than 3 million kina to rehabilitate the health facility. They were supposed to sign an agreement with the provincial health authority to transfer the responsibility of the facility. After eight years, the MOU remains unsigned by the government and much of the infrastructure remained unused. Over a period of three years, the Catholic Archdiocese of Medang spent more than three million kina to rehabilitate the Joseph Stahl Health Facility. Some of that money came from the Australian government through the incentive fund. But those facilities remain largely unused because of an arrangement that hasn't been formalized 
between the provincial government and the Medan Catholic Archdiocese. The idea was to make Joseph Stahl become a referral site for 10 satellite facilities within the Middle Ramu district. And it's been six years since the draft agreement was handed over to the provincial government. Since then, the health administration structure has changed. Health services are now governed by a provincial health authority and the parties listed in the initial agreement no longer exist and are no longer valid. Since 2013, except for the infrastructure development, we have not been able to improve or achieve what we wanted to do, simply because um, terms of the MOA that we entered into were not agreed to by our partners. Patrick Angrai, the officer in charge of Joseph Stahl, is one of just four health workers manning the 32 staff facility. Uh, one time me, he got a triple C, it's definitely so. One plan staff, low retrenchment aid. And they're expected to support 10 satellite facilities, a job that is next to impossible with no funding support and no road access. How can I cover the total nine, eight posts and two community health, health posts? The administrative blockages in Medang town and the six-year delay in getting things done has affected more than 20,000 people who live in and around Josephstal. The health system has collapsed, and if it weren't for the four-man health team led by Patrick Angrai, the people of Josephstal would not be able to treat simple illnesses like malaria. Scott Whitey, National MTV News, Lay. The Minister for Agriculture and Livestock, John Simon, isn't happy with the alleged actions of police on civilian officers from his department, including their families at their residence in Port Moresby. The incident, which started on Friday, Christmas Day last week, involving the department compound security and an outsider, continued with attacks on the residents and their properties. The minister flew into the city late yesterday to attend to his department staff who were harassed and intimidated by a group of men during the long Christmas break. He was disappointed in the actions of a few that led to the destruction of properties. After five weeks at Loloata, goodness me, I need to go for a break. I'm back here because of this. Minister, and where will my DL staff go to? Borunegro policeman or Borunegro rascal? Why are we entertaining policemen like this? Metsu, Deputy Commissioner, Commissioner, are we training policemen at Bomana or not? Or are we training criminals up in Bomana? On Christmas Day, an argument between an outsider and security manning the staff compound for the Department of Agriculture and Livestock turned nasty. They alleged police involvement in the incident that saw families fleeing for their lives and homes and properties destroyed. It's got nothing to do with DL stuff. The issue is nothing to do with DL. It's to do with the security guards manning the gate. Just because they checked that drunken whoever he is who came in to visit his in-law, who is a DL staff, they did not like the idea of him being checked. Simple as that. It's an issue that should have been sorted out. And why do they have to come back on Saturday? They came in, what have happened? Why did they have to come and terrorize the people on Sunday? An official complaint was signed by the department and presented to the city police, represented by Inspector Robert Wani. He gave his assurance that the city police, through the hierarchy, will do investigations to find out who was involved. Minister Simon says the police uniform must be respected and not tarnished. I want those uh, policemen and the families and whoever is responsible, meet up finish. We deal with DHL, so we can help you to go and settle back at home by providing cocoa necessary and coffee necessary for you. I think that's what you're good at. You're not feeding up to wear uniform. The residents have collected empty bullet shells from the shots fired during the attacks and will supply it for police investigations. Bradley Valenaki, National MTV News. You're watching National MTV News among stories after the break, MVIL reforms and citrus farming. Those stories and more after these messages. Stay with us. Welcome back. The Marape-led government is expected to make amendments in the Motor Vehicle Insurance Limited legislation in the new year. State-owned Enterprises Minister William Duma says these amendments will be tabled when Parliament sits in April 2021. 
come 2021, mining and forestry companies can expect changes to the MVIL legislations. Changes that will see the compulsory registration of all mining and company vehicles operating at mining or forestry sites. And in the logging areas, which have been exempt to the provisions of the, uh, the legislation under which uh, MBL is operating from, will no longer be exempt now. They'll be covered. So under the PM's direction, when Prime Minister, uh, when Parliament resumes in April, we will present an amendment to, to the existing legislation such that all the others will be covered. So you are going to see exp uh, an increase in revenue for, for our country. For other businesses and privately owned companies, the registration fees for the different types of vehicles for 2021 will be the same as 2020. However, the fees may vary depending on the provincial MVIL offices. Every, every vehicle in our country is asked to register. And if there's a road accident, someone has lost life, uh, we we're forming to ensure that uh, your insurance, your, the passenger or the, uh, the person in the vehicle is probably covered by the insurance program that uh, you pay in, in as far as uh, when you register your car every year. So uh, that exact increase will be, will be announced later on by the board, but it's a good increase. That's something I could announce to our country. It is part of our reform way. You raise the car, car probably, MVL, just as much as like giving 50 million to help assist a company. For the people, we haven't compromised people uh, safety, people compensation, people uh, in the vehicle. And in fact, our government is thinking about an increase. It's going to be a, quite a substantial increase. In 2021, MVIL will also increase the insurance fees to be paid out when someone dies from a car accident. That increase will double from 5,000 kina per person to 10,000 kina per person. Uh, but in terms of changes in prices and things like that, no, we don't do that. Uh, we are an insurance company, which is a compulsory third party. That's our core business. The registration part of it is actually a provincial government function. We are actually a delegated body that we do it, and then we collect the funds and give it back to the provincial government. So uh, in that area, there is no change. Thekla Gunga, National MTV News. Lays Metropolitan Commander Chief Superintendent Chris Kunyanban says missing person complaints reported by the public is important and needs urgent attention. He said a lot of cases were reported, however, not much effort was put into the search of missing persons by the police. Kunyanban said he will make sure all the police posts under his command investigate such cases and give confidence back to the community. In the past, we used to have a lot of reports regarding the lost persons, and uh, uh, it is a precedent where most of these stations, if you look at it, uh, probably because of manpower shortage and uh, how we handle the situation of a uh, missing person, it's a very big concern to the public, and I appreciate that. Uh, going forward, uh, we police have to really improve on how we assist those people who report uh, incidents of missing persons. Uh, most of the time it's reported and uh, it's left in the file, uh, no, ma not much been done, especially in the follow-ups. But going forward, uh, we would like to really improve. For my command, I really want to improve and you know, give some confidence back to the public. Uh, uh, persons, uh, the lives of people are very, very important. Now uh, we're here to protect lives and property, so it's very important that we uh, investigate the missing person uh, properly and then at least give a feedback to the uh, people who con uh, people who had lodged their complaint, the victims, so that they are happy about how we do our policy services. So we will try to improve. Yes, we have a very big problem with that, but we will try to improve. With the country having the potential to grow citrus and supply domestic markets, the Agriculture Department is pushing for citrus farming in the country. In Juwaka province, the department is taking the lead in promoting and cultivating citrus, which have seen people getting into citrus farming. The commercialization of citrus will sustain domestic markets, provide food security and address malnutrition in the country. 
to help promote citrus farming in the country, a citrus nursery was established in Ziwaka province. And hybrid citrus seedlings have been distributed to various highlands provinces and Morobe province. There are over 300 seedlings and over 10,000 farmers going into citrus farming. This is to ensure the country becomes self-sufficient in food production through citrus farming and to help domestic markets. Uh, we have uh, started the citrus project in 2009 in uh, Timilwaki and the uh, Mins district of Jiu, Joga province. Uh, and we, it's about uh, 10 years now that we have uh, been doing this uh, citrus uh, project. The citrus fruits includes oranges, mandarins, lime and lemons among others. It has high economic returns and it is highly medicinal as it is rich in vitamin C and prevents diseases. But over the years, PNG has been a major importer of citrus fruits to sustain domestic markets. This resulted in high prices of oranges and other citrus fruits in supermarkets. To address this issue, there are plans to commercialize citrus farming to support domestic markets. Uh, we can be able to sustain our domestic market demands. We can be able to totally and fully replace importation of uh, uh, citrus fruit and citrus blends uh, or substrate coming in from Australia and other countries. Uh, Papua New Guinea has the potential to uh, fully sustain uh, our domestic market demands. By the department is working in partnership with the Jiwaka Provincial Government to develop citrus farms and nurseries in the province. And they have planted over 100,000 citrus seedlings last year. Recently, the department with various commodity boards visited these farms and urged farmers to produce high-quality fruits to supply PNG markets. And there are also plans to go into downstream processing. In 2022, Jiwaka will have planted... Uh uh, between five to six hundred thousand citizens in the country of Papua New Guinea will declare Jiwaka Orange Country. And uh, we are also planning to uh, go down, uh, establish a downstream processing unit in Jiwaka so that uh, we will process uh, citrus fruits in Jiwaka. So Rayon Lakingu National, MTV News. For many children growing up in Port Moresby settlement, it's quite difficult to get out to experience what the city has to offer. Trips outside of their environment may be limited to schools, hospitals and certain vital services. And as such, they're unsure what to do during their holidays. Fortunately for some kids at Vada Vada settlement, they got to spend their morning at the Port Moresby Nature Park. The small nursery attendees between the ages of two to five years old had an experience of a lifetime coming close to animals they only hear about and watch on television. Port Moresby Nature Park's education officers were on the ground as usual to welcome and give the children a tour of the park's inhabitants. Neighboring kids from the Moale Heights Sabbath School also visited the park for their holiday excursion. And now looking at the Nasfund market report, the Kina opened unchanged at 0 0.2850 US dollars in the interbank market this morning. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina will buy 0.2775 US dollars, 0.3615 Australian dollars, 0.2189 Euro and 28.14 Japanese Yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York Close, gold is trading higher, coffee and cocoa closed lower, copra closed higher. Palm oil closed higher, crude oil is trading higher, and copper closed lower. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed 204.1 points higher. The ASX 200 is trading at 35.52 points higher, and the All Ordinaries is trading at 44.61 points higher. You're watching National MTV News. We'll be back with stories making headlines overseas after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the news. Turning overseas, stormwater and wastewater networks around New Zealand are buckling under the pressure of extreme weather events. Climate change experts say the race is on to flood-proof the systems, but warn flooding isn't the only problem. The Napier floods in November, a 1 in 250 year event that our storm and wastewater systems simply aren't built for. 
The network of pipes might be out of sight, but they're not out of mind for climate researchers who warn that scenes like this are on the rise. As rainfall increases in intensity and frequency and we've got systems that are designed based on historical conditions and in many cases undersized, we're going to see more often that communities are flooded. Low-lying communities are bearing the brunt. Porirua, a city of 56,000, has 90 flooding hotspots. The 60-year-old pipes are cracking under the stress. They are completely not fit for purpose because they're designed for a 1 in 10 and these days everything is like a 1 in 50 or a 1 in 30. Huge heavy rains. It's a multi-million dollar headache for Porirua. I've got a $1.8 billion bill over 20 years to fix the pipes but I haven't got 20 years to do it. And for the rest of the country. Over $30 billion to bring it up to the level of service we expect now. That's without climate change, that's without resilience. And then you add in climate change and what does it look like? Oh, that would be probably double, triple. The solutions aren't straightforward. We might have to think about in coastal areas or next to river floodplains how those communities can move in the next 50 years over time to areas that are, are less exposed to flooding. Another suggestion, learning to live with more of this. That might mean redesigning our streets to convey floodwaters more often. There's a good conversation to be had with consumers of what is the level of service expected and what they want out of their networks. That's never happened. Just as too much water can cause problems, so too do droughts. Low water flow can cause odour and toxicity in pipes. Extreme weather putting the waste in stormwater systems to the test. A live lobster export industry is one of the many businesses to feel the effects of COVID-19. Fjordland Lobster Company has seen both extremes from months of complete shutdown to booming sales for the rest of the year. But there are still some challenges. They're one of our most precious seafoods, lurking in the cooler waters of Fjordland's coast. But 2020 has seen the industry both sink and swim due to the pandemic. Fiordland Lobster Company makes up a third of the highly valuable live lobster export market, the industry feeling the impacts right from the start. Well, we're having a, a great season leading into Chinese New Year, which is late January, and our business just stopped. I mean, we had three months of no business. The lobster trade is a massive money earner for the New Zealand economy, bringing in more than $300 million every year, with 90% of this seafood destined for China. And it's a massive operation to get it there from catching the kaimoana to it being hallied out and transferred into trucks and carted here to the Tiano holding plant where it's sorted and flown from Christchurch. It's been able to run again thanks to China's handling of COVID and government funding for non-perishable goods. We rebounded really well um, as an industry and, and as in most of the primary sectors in New Zealand that um, have export marketplaces and, that, and particularly the drive from China, you know, they did a great job in terms of getting their economy up and running again. Meaning all the jobs here could be saved. Good, busy enough, we've been keeping out of mischief. And it's bounced back and it's been pretty mental ever since. So it's been good. But it still comes with challenges which can change daily. A COVID scare in China caused another setback last month. At the Shanghai airport, you know, there was one incident of COVID. 16,000 employees at the airport were tested. And so it disrupted their whole sort of management of the airport logistics, which meant we went on hold for seven days. You've just got to be on the ball always. Um, expect the unexpected. You just got to um, and accept things that are beyond your control. 2020 delivering one extreme to the other. The best way to describe it? My year I'll never forget. One that they've managed to claw back. The sister of a man killed in the Christchurch terrorist attack says more needs to be done to stop racism in New Zealand. It follows a run-in she and her mother had with a couple while shopping in North Canterbury. Born and bred. Stop. Does it matter if I'm in New Zealand? Aya Alumari and her mother were shopping at the farmer's store in Rangiora when they say they were targeted by another shopper. So me and my mum were speaking in Arabic. Um, so it was, it was at that moment when she said, oh, it's OK, it won't be long before they leave our country. So that's when she started filming. And I had to analyse in my head, OK, if I shrug it off, Chances are she's going to do this to someone else and she needs to be stopped. She says they were told to go home. Going home and it seems to be a good idea. Why did you say we go home? I said going home would be a good idea. 
incidents like this continue to happen. And this one just happened to be filmed. I'm sure there are many such incidents happening all the time where people haven't whipped out their phone and recorded what's happening. The Islamic Women's Council says what happened to Aya and her mother underline the need for new laws. This incident shows why hate crime needs to be added to the Crimes Act and it's a long time coming. It should have been done uh, before now but it is urgent. This is one of those simple and easy pieces of legislation. The work has been done. There's no reason to delay it. They can go ahead and pass this early in the new year. The Royal Commission of inquiry into the mosque attacks released this month recommended laws against hate crime be introduced and the government has said it will be looking into them. Hate is, 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 can grow into something a lot bigger like we saw in, in March 15 last year where I lost my brother. New Zealand. I is grateful for the messages of support she's received since posting the video and for the staff who dealt with the situation. She's planning to report this incident to police in hopes by telling her story attitudes will change. There was nothing that defined 2020 more than the battle against COVID-19. In New Zealand, 25 people have died from the illness, but it could have been much worse. Packed beaches, crowded parks, New Zealand's enjoying a summer other countries would envy. But rewind back to March and it was a different story. From 11.59pm tonight, we will close our border to any non-residents and citizens attempting to travel here. At that point, we had just 28 COVID cases. We have moved to fight by going hard and going early. By the end of the month, it was clear why. The country forced into lockdown. This is a COVID-19 announcement. Streets abandoned, schooling, working, baking, exercising, all done at home. And just days into alert level four. Sadly, New Zealand has had its first death linked to COVID-19. Many hotels then turned into managed isolation facilities for returning New Zealanders. Cases grew at a rapid rate. In late March, we reached our peak of 84 cases in one day alone. But it only took a few weeks to get the numbers under control. Control. With our daily cases dropping, so too did our alert levels. And it turns out we really missed our coffee. Never tasted better. Takeaways. All right, here we go. It up. Cheers. Oh. And the taste of freedom. Oh, that's it. Oh. The daily updates rolled on. Kia ora koutou katoa, welcome. Kia ora koutou, kia ora koutou, kia ora koutou. And after a series of bungles, the army took over managed isolation facilities. Police brought in to stop people escaping. A window was forced open, uh, broken off its security latches, and then a six-foot fence was climbed. Life was returning to normal, then at a hurriedly called late-night news conference. After 102 days, we have our first cases of COVID-19 Auckland went back into lockdown. The chaos at the supermarket returned. Strange times we live in. I know that the virus re-emerging in our community has caused alarm. Lines too at testing centres. We've seen what it looks like overseas when we don't get this right. That August cluster became our largest, 179 cases in total. The origin still unknown. QR codes were made mandatory for businesses. Also compulsory, mask wearing on all public transport in Auckland and domestic flights around the country. There will be some things we have to routinely do, even at alert level one. That and the smell of hand sanitizer isn't the only thing COVID has left us with. Unemployment's high, families are still struggling, many businesses haven't made up for being shut down for months. And while the whole country's been at alert level one since October... To use a cricketing analogy, we do not want to drop a catch now. In the words of the Prime Minister, 2020 has been, frankly, terrible. But vaccines are now rolling out worldwide, bringing hope that 2021 one may be a bit brighter. Chukai Sports is next. Fidelis Sukina joins us at the sports desk. Thank you, Helen. An update on Queensland Rugby League new rules and some sporting action from the NCD Governors Cup. Those stories and more after the break.
Tukai Sports. Good night and welcome to Trukai Sports. The Queensland Rugby League earlier this month issued a memo on the changes to some of the rules in the Queensland statewide competitions. The Interest Super Cup, which the SPPNG Hunters take part in, will have to accustom themselves with the new rules, which include the six again rule used by the NRL in Australia. One heck of a contest this afternoon. After ending prematurely in round one of the 2020 season due to COVID-19, the Queensland Interest Super Cup is building hype for the return to competition in March of 2021. But inevitably, there had to be changes to some of the rules in the competition. A memo sent out early this month by the Queensland Rugby League outlined the new rule changes, which will come into effect in the 2021 season of the Interest Super Cup. The memo has pointed out the four rules implemented in all statewide competitions in 2020 will be maintained. They are the 2040 kick, the mutual increment restart, mid-air tackles and trainers stopping plays. The proposed rules for the 2021 season are for the six again rule, four ruck infringements and 10 meter infringements. The other rule is the lateral position of the scrum. The other rule is for the message runners, where there will be restrictions on the trainers to deliver messages to players. There is also a proposed rule for play the ball restart and for incorrect play the ball a handover rather than a penalty. Also, the referee will call break when they are satisfied that the ball is out of the scrum. The last proposed rule for the 2021 season is for field goals outside the 40 meters, which will now be awarded two points instead of one. There is one rule that has been removed from the 2021 season. That is the mandatory six players in each scrum. Here in Port Moresby, the SPPNG Hunters coach Matthew Church had anticipated the rule changes to the Intra Super Cup 2021 season and has conditioned training to have the players familiarize themselves to the rules and have a routine on coping with the fast pace of the Intra Super Cup next season. Digital Cup does not use these rules and for these players it will be a step into a different direction. But the team has a determined coach who sees potential to have the players ready for the rule changes. The NCD Governors Cup heads into their qualifying finals round of matches as teams gear up for the business end of the competition. The finals will be played on Wednesday the 30th of December at the Sir William Skate Oval in Kaugere. The NCD Governors Cup played the first round of qualifying finals matches yesterday at the Sir William Skate Oval in Kaugere. With the top two teams from eight pools qualifying for the knockout stage of the competition. The intensity on the field picked up as the remaining 16 teams from around Port Mosby locked horns for a share of the 100,000 kina in prize money. So far, the games here, nothing, no, no trouble, nothing. The game went perfectly well. Tournament coordinators hoped that the competition will provide an avenue for young prospective talents who have yet to be identified, along with encouraging healthy competition amongst clubs during the off-season. We thank you to the Honourable Governor of NCD who's also a patron of this competition to increase the price every year. So now he's increased the price and the trophy price money to 20,000 kina from last year and this year. The finals of the 2020 NCD Governors Cup will be held tomorrow, Wednesday 30th December at the Sir William Skate Oval. Haxte Lovai, Chukai Sports. We'll have more sporting action for you on the other side of this break. Stay with us. Chukai Sports. Good night and welcome back to Trukai Sports. COVID-19 disrupted a whole year of planning for the Olympics and World Cup qualifications in 2021. But while international matches were thrown out the window, there is a silver lining for a team that's very much focused on youth. Just over a year ago, something finally for all Whites fans to get excited about. Four white shirts in the middle. 
and Callum McCowett. A first international match in 525 days, supposedly heralding the start of a bumper year for the new coach. Fast forward 12 months and glamour fixtures against Belgium, England, binned, thanks to the global pandemic. Yeah, that was tough to swallow. It's uh, it's not every every day that you get to play against the number one and number four teams in the world. Um, and particularly that opportunity to play at Wembley um, was a massive one to pass up. The upside, the depth of the players has arguably never been better. The best thing is that the players have been playing. They're all in their professional football environments. We've got a lot of young Kiwis particularly forging, forging their careers and making their way over in Europe as well. Liberato Kikache and Sapreet Singh, among those youngsters likely to be involved in March's World Cup qualifiers as well as July's Tokyo Olympics, where football's an under-23 competition with three overaged players allowed. One player hoping to benefit from that dual approach to the All-Whites, 23-year-old Wellington Phoenix signing Clayton Lewis. For me to be now with the Phoenix and be training at a high intensity every day, it helps me keep a keep a good uh, level of fitness. So, you know, hope, hopefully that I, I can get some games under my belt and, you know, Danny can watch those and hopefully be impressed. For a coach starved of fixtures, having selection headaches is a problem he'd love to have next year. The opportunity to have a, a you know, meaningful um, games, meaningful contact time with the players is going to be huge just to start to build that connection, the culture within the group. A group that's desperate to reunite and take those first steps to qualifying for a FIFA World Cup. As we finally wind down on the year that was 2020, it's safe to say the sporting world entered uncharted territory this year, from the Tokyo Olympics being postponed to stadiums without fans, and then the emergence of virtual sport from your living room. Bum, bum, bottom, bum, bottom, bum, ah, 2020. Where do we start? How about in Sydney? The Black Caps versus Australia, the first time we were shown what sport without fans truly looked like. Fit it yourself, Fergie. But if we thought that was weird, what unfolded in the weeks and months to come was indescribable. First, sport around the globe stopped. Nothing, and we really mean nothing to watch. NBA play is suspended. Then, before we knew it, we were back. The Korean Football League of all places, the first to get the ball rolling. Sports fans from around the globe tuning in to finally get some sort of sporting fix. Temperature tests, zero fans, and that sweet, sweet sound of fake crowd noise. Speaking of fake crowd noise, who knew it was even a thing? This Kiwi responsible for pumping the noise into stadiums for the English Premier League. This row is our clap loop. From empty grandstands to cardboard cutouts. The K-League then going one step further or one step too far. These sex dolls used to fill the empty space. The NBA transported their fans into the arena from their lounge suites via Zoom. The whole competition in fact staged at Florida's Disneyland. Some found it easy, some not so much. Look at the blanket bro. Big Stevie though, didn't care one bit. It's not Syria mate, you know what I mean, like it's not, it's not that hard. The NFL on the other hand powered on with its season. Let's just say they've had mixed results since. Perhaps the biggest change to sport was the emergence of virtual racing. Dunedin's Ella Harris, a top performer on the world stage of Zwift, even our best triathletes jumped on board. Uh, it's always a highlight getting one up on Aussies. The V8 supercars went virtual along with Formula One, NASCAR and Formula E. The latter embroiled in controversy with German Daniel Apt caught using a professional game for his race. To be honest, I'm, I'm questioning uh, if it was really Daniel. And disqualified. Super Rugby had to change, most would say, for the better. The new Aotearoa competition here to stay in 2021. So as we roll into next year and our support for the Wollongong Phoenix, the Tamworth Warriors and the Melbourne Breakers heats up, let's remember a year like no other. A year where nothing was out of the question. A year where sport eventually came out on top. And that story ends Trukai Sports. Helen will be back with the weather details for the next 24 hours. Don't go away. Trukai Sports. True Kai Sports.
This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. A look at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region. Possible rain showers and thunder tonight. Then a fine partly cloudy morning in Port Moresby. Partly cloudy tonight with morning rain drizzles in Alotau. In the Mamasi region, mostly cloudy tonight with morning showers and drizzles in Lee. Light drizzles tonight and fine partly cloudy morning in Vanimo. In the New Guinea Islands region, mostly cloudy with morning shower or two in Lorengau. Thundery rain showers tonight, then a fine morning in Buka. And in the Highlands region, cloudy with rain drizzles tonight in Hagen. And occasional rain showers and thunderstorms with the morning fog in Mendi and Wabeg. The weather update was proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. And that's been the new sport and weather for today, Tuesday, the 29th of December 2020. On behalf of the entire MTV News team right around the country, pleasant viewing. Thank you for your company. Good night.